Hey, welcome to Drill Down Insider. I'm Corey Johnson, Chief Market Strategist for Epistrophe Capital Research. As we drill down to the people and businesses powering technology-driven change, joining us right now uh, is uh, Synopsys CFO, Sheila Glazer. Um, really important company in the world, uh, generally in the world of semiconductor design, particularly in this era of AI and semiconductor-driven change. Indeed, Sheila, glad to have you with us. Um, such an interesting time for Synopsys. How, when you kind of look at it from a 30,000 foot view, which maybe you don't get to do, what are the big changes driving your business right now that weren't around five years ago? Corey, it's great to see you. Uh, well, when I look at it, and I mean, it's funny because a 30,000 foot view, yeah, it's hard to do that because, uh, you know, on the daily basis, we're in the grind. But you know, I was at Intel for almost 30 years. And so I knew this company before I came to this company, but then I came to this company and realized I didn't know this company at all. And uh, it's really just the mission critical nature of what it is that we're doing for our customers. So we are the software tool set that customers use to develop advanced computing. And that sounds so um, hard to imagine that you build advanced computing and software tools. And uh, in the old days, you know, I mean, it was hard to go node to node, but now it's impossible to go to node, node to node. And the, the time frames that people are trying to do this are even more impossible. In the old days, it was, you know, hundreds of millions of transistors. Now it's billions of transistors. So the scale of the problem that we're solving is so immense that absolutely nobody can do these things without the tools and capabilities that we have. And we really think about our role and sort of unleashing our customers' innovation. And, and frankly, there's you know so much happening right now in the industry that uh, we've just become super mission critical to our customers. It's such an interesting time in the world of semiconductors because there is such uh, tremendous innovation right now um, and really the growth that we haven't seen um, for maybe 20 years. I, I, I guess I just kind of got used to a very steady state of slow growth in, in the power of semiconductors. And then we've, we've hit this amazing leap in the last few years. Yeah, absolutely. And I think in some sense, it's almost that whole idea of that Jevons paradox that the more compute you get, the more new things are unlocked. I mean, I've been thinking a lot of that with AI, the the availability of compute, the availability of the large language models creates really um, almost this insatiable need for things. And you're right. I think we're, we're in a next great era of uh, unlocking the next level of compute. I feel like there's also a lot of startups. So I didn't. That was another thing I did not see coming. Is is dozens and dozens of startups in the world of semiconductors and billions of dollars of venture capital going into them. I know. It feels like. Um you know, we call it Silicon Valley for a reason, right? And it feels like for uh, for some period of time, we forgot the Silicon part of Silicon Valley, right. and it's back again. Absolutely. So uh, um, in the quarter you guys just reported, um, uh, your CEO, Sassine uh, Ghazi, talked about the, um, the sort of tale of two cities, right? The tale of two worlds, which is AI doing really great and going great guns and nothing slowing down, and then everything else. I wonder how you can kind of categorize uh, that and, and look at your business as it performed in the last 13 weeks. Yeah, sure. So the way we think about uh, the business is, first of all, we just reported a record 2024. So just put that put that out there. We were up 15% uh, in revenue yeah. and op margin up two points, EPS up 25%. And as we look at 25, our fiscal 25, uh, we did talk about there is a tale of two markets. So this race ahead that we've been talking about on AI, and then really uh, customers that are more indexed to consumer, PC, automotive, and industrial are just moving at a slower pace. And so as we think about servicing our customers, we're indexed to their R&D, which obviously doesn't move around as much as you know their top line may move around, uh, but those customers are just moving at a different pace. So how do we best support them as they're all in search of infusing AI into their um, tools and technology, but their uh, pace is just slower? How are you using AI in your work um, right now, I wonder what processes have changed for you um, in the finance function using AI. 
Yeah, well, I would say I would answer the question in two parts. One is obviously we've infused AI into our tools for our customers, so we also uh, do that. So our engineers use AI for themselves, and we're investing heavily in making sure that uh, you know we're we're taking advantage of that across our engineering. And in finance, I would say we haven't necessarily found the killer app. Uh, we're using it in areas to help streamline. I mean, we we can use the um, uh, uh, the you know functions that we have in the Microsoft to be able to co-pilot, to be able to summarize things, and then we're using um, 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 new tools with that are coming with our vendors. So you know, as we are bringing in some of the uh, new tools that we're bringing into the environment, ServiceNow is actually one of them. We're looking at how we use sort of their agent software too. Yes, yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's it's there's so many new opportunities that are opening up that we're finding new places and that we can actually maybe want better tools to use. Um, I, I also, you know, when we look at the development that you guys are seeing, there's also this interesting thing happening with um, uh, Synopsys where you're going beyond the semiconductor and into the systems around it. Um, can you talk a little bit about where that business sits and how we can understand both the opportunity and how it's being realized? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the biggest, uh, most interesting things that uh, we're doing is uh, we uh, announced the acquisition of Ansys, and we're working through that process, and we're really talking about silicon to systems. And the reason we're talking about that and is really it's a customer need. Right now, when you design silicon, Silicon's eventually going to be in something, but you design the thing it's going to be in separately from the silicon. And so what that means is a lot of times when you put those two things together, you find out there's some kind of issue. And when you find an issue late in a design cycle, it costs money and it takes time. If you can find the issue early, then you can course correct around it. And so we want to bring those two design environments together, the digital design environment and the mechanical physical design environment. Because you can think about a system being, it can be, um, you know, a, a car can be a system that you want to co-design what's happening between the digital design and the physical design. A data center can be a system. You want to co-design what's happening in the silicon and then the overall, you know, heat power um, energy levels inside the data center. But it's really being able to bring those two two design centers, uh, design environments together. Yeah, it's, it's something I've been thinking a lot as, as it relates to Synopsys a lot. I've been writing about it as well. About there's all this discussion about data centers going to nuclear power and how shocking. Three Mile Island's going to get turned on again, and and uh, because data centers need so much power, and there's so much need for, and demand for um, uh, juicing these systems. But on the same side, on the opposite side of of that, I should say, um, is a smart design using tools like Synopsys to reduce the need for that power, reduces the need for the nuclear energy and everything else. That they there's sort of uh, two sides of the same thing. Yeah, I mean we're in uh, we're in this era where the real want is to be able to have infinite compute power, infinite compute performance at zero power. Like that's one of the hardest engineering challenges in the world because obviously those two things uh, work work at opposite. And you're right, if you can solve it at the early stages of design, if you can understand where the where the you know kind of the heat. Um, and power inefficiency is, you can solve it very early in design to allow much more power efficient data center. Because when you put the chips together, you know, millions or hundreds of thousands or however many chips you're going to end up putting together, a small improvement in power in every single chip is going to add up to massive improvements at a data center scale. It's, it's just, interesting. I guess, I guess maybe the nuclear thing is just so much more shocking than actual design efficiency, that that's what gets discussed, not the design efficiency that Synopsys can bring. Absolutely. And I think it's, I think it's really those two design environments have been so, so distinctly different. Uh, we're solving, we're solving when we bring ANSYS together, which is the leader in multi-physics, we're the leader in digital design. We're bringing the two best tools together and we bring them together much earlier in the design process to be able to spot those issues, to be able to cure them at the initial design stage. And you're right, I think that the, you know, the beauty of this industry though, it, you know, just reflecting back on some of the things you, you and I have been talking about, the beauty of this industry is we're never satisfied with anything. I can't think of a time we've ever been satisfied with anything. And so that's what gives us such great business opportunity. You know, 
so you you did something that almost to me that is no, almost no one has ever done ever, which is give me a new sense of optimism when we had a conversation of a month or two ago about engineers. And you you said something to me about uh, early in your career, you learned you had to part with an, with an engineer, and I'm, I'll let you tell that story. But but that engineers have this belief in any problem is solvable with the right amount of time and money. And the conversation was started with us talking about how you can determine how much is enough for R and D budgets. But I've been thinking about that concept for so much, uh, so much that this idea that engineers are optimists and that problems are solvable. And I, I'm not naturally an optimistic person, and yet I've had this newfound optimism. I credit you with. But talk to me about that that relationship you have. As a, as, a, as a technology CFO with finance and technology coming together. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think this is uh, one of the beautiful things about uh, technology and finance coming together is I feel like they're really opposites, you know, the same coin, but just different sides to the coin. Because engineers are always in search of solutions, which is like, what a great what a great thing. And, uh, you know, as we're talking about, there's so many problems. You know, people want infinite uh, compute, uh, but there's not enough power. Okay, well, we're going to go solve that problem, right? We don't know how, but we're going to go solve that problem. And um, then, you know, what do finance people want? Finance people want infinite revenue at zero cost, Right, like so. These are these are both sides of the same coin. So as as the engineers solve those things, how do we think about where do we invest to be able to solve that problem? What's the right set of um, uh, resources? What's the right set of ca capabilities to be able to help solve the problem? To be able to get to the solution? And you know, what are engineers in search of? They're in search of you know being able to hit their design cycles, being able to hit the requirements from the customer, and doing it in a high quality way. Okay, well, how do we invest properly for the engineers to be able to do that? What's, you know, what's the right sequence of events? And then in the finance side, then how do we monetize that? How do we capture value? We're creating value for a customer. How do we uh, capture that value? So I love it. I feel like this, you know, the, the marriage between engineers and finance is a perfect marriage. And and you talked about how early in your career you learned that, that you someone told you that you needed to have a partner in, in engineering. You needed to have somebody that would be there for you to consult with. Or explain that to me. Yeah, yeah. So when I first started um, at Intel, and actually this is a million years ago, uh, but I first started there. Uh, the um, and this is really going to be uh, the gross margins were like ninety eight percent, and I was trying to convince people to have them be ninety nine percent. So that was my big, you know, call to action, and no one could get too excited about that, but I was excited <laughs> about it. And I realized that part of it was because I was talking like some kind of finance textbook. I didn't really understand the work that the engineers were doing, and so I made my engineering friend to understand like, well, what problems were they facing? You know, how could I be of service to them? How could I help? How could I help remove barriers for them? And how can I understand the problems that they were trying to solve better? And then help translate those into how that would improve the financials. And it turned out there was a number of problems that they had. And what I was able to help them with is, well, how do we get them some tools to be able to solve these problems? Because they were having yield problems. Well, I can help help make sure that they've got the tools that they can solve the yield problems. That was a problem they wanted to solve. For me, it helped translate into better gross margin. For them, they wanted to solve a yield problem. And and, uh, and and I guess it probably makes it more interesting too. I mean, when you, like I can get lost in my spreadsheets and my model, particularly for, and I want to talk about this too, but when a company say sells a division and restates numbers going backwards and then forwards and all my projections are out the window, like synopsis is, it can be lots of fun with um, Excel in the last year. Um, uh, I can get lost in the numbers and start to not think about what they connect to because they're that can happen. Um, but it probably makes the work a lot more interesting when you're connecting yeah, to the actual processes. Absolutely, because I think of the you know the financials is really the scorecard of the strategy, and the engineers are the ones that operationalize the strategy. And obviously, the go-to-market team and the HR team and the legal team and everybody. But I think about it really as you know, kind of wrapping all those things together with the financials. But it all comes back to what the engineers are generating, because that's really the source of the value. And we talked at the beginning of this conversation about how the quarter, how the year gave you 15% uh, uh, year-over-year growth in terms of revenues. Margins got better. 
Um, and it was a spectacularly fantastic year for this already very big business. But you also went through a ton of change. You changed the fan belt while the engine was running in terms of doing a big acquisition, changing your CEO, um, uh, uh, you know, passing the baton on. It was a, a less dramatic change we see sometimes. Um, and also this, um, uh, this, this getting rid of a division and, you know, really changing how the, what the business is. Well, it just speaks to the operational excellence of this company because uh, any one of those things, as you said, would have been a heavy lift. The combination of all of them was certainly, um, you know, quite notable. It was a transformational year for us. Uh, and really, uh, every person in the company rose to be able to do those things. And so I think it just speaks to uh, the strength of this company, the strength of the team, and really our focus on making sure that uh, we commit and deliver to everything that we set out to do. Oh, yeah, there's this other thing as your ind entire industry is going through a, a dramatic change at the same moment. Yeah, and I think in some sense, that's what makes this so fun. You know, it wouldn't be boring if we just came in and it was just Monday and then it was Tuesday and then it was Wednesday. But that's not what happens here, right? It's, it's um, as you said, uh, the amount of uh, transformational things that we did as a company in 12 months uh, is really exciting and we're not done yet. Uh, we're taking the company to their next great era and the next, you know, first half of 25, we'll be onboarding ANSYS, building out that new design environment that you've talked about and really think about us as becoming the software company for engineering. And I mean, that's so exciting because you think about like how many industries are have people in engineering that are not able to get their job done as well as they would like to get it done to be able to build that next great and wonderful product. And it's really exciting to think about. All right, Synopsis CFO, Sheila Glazer. Great conversation. Thanks for having uh, joining us on the Drill Down Corey, Insider. great to see you. Thank you so much. All right, coming up next on the Drill Down, The Bite, the one number that tells us a whole lot about Synopsis. And we're back with the Drill Down Bite, the one number that tells us a whole lot. That number is $6,127,436,000. Yes, that was the revenues for the fiscal year of 2024 for Synopsis. 15% growth, uh, again, from surging demand for AI-powered chip design tools and, and AI-enhanced verification capabilities in that software, just critical, mission critical, as they say, for semiconductor companies trying to design our future. All right, thanks for listening to Drill Down Insider. I'm Corey Johnson. The Drill Down Insider is a production of Epistrophe Capital Research.